Hey everyone, welcome back to Jordan Kurtz, New England Megaliths. Uh, I'm really excited about this presentation. Um, I think this is my most concise but thorough presentation to date. Uh, I'm going to tie in um, a lot of different common Native American uh, stone structures with megaliths that I find uh, around New England, particularly New Hampshire. I'm going to show how those connect to megalith structures globally um, and base those findings in uh, uh, legitimate archaeological studies um, such as Manitou um, and one other uh, book I'm forgetting but you will see the the page referenced uh, in this study in this in this presentation. And just something I want you to kind of keep in the back of your head as I go through this presentation. Um, Let's go backwards. Uh, hum the date of human habitation of the Americas is always being pushed back. So here we see humans may have occupied North America 100,000 years earlier than thought. So I don't consider archaeology a hard science whatsoever. It's sort it's detective work. Um, the the dates are always changing. It, it seems we get earlier and earlier estimations of when humans were in North America. Um, that be, so that being said, it's likely that uh, we New Englanders are walking over the bones of many tens of thousands, at least, years of civilizations in New England. It wasn't just the natives that the colonists encountered uh, going back a few hundred years. There were people in New England most likely going back many tens of thousands of years, so that's something to keep in mind. Another other thing to keep in mind, when I mention these New England megaliths, I've, recently I've been providing weights uh, for the size of these rocks, and while they're very large, remember that the average stone, uh, the, the average megalith in Stonehenge just across the pond is a 50,000 pound block. These are much bigger than the vast majority of the stuff I'm finding here. And and just something to think about, if there was a civilization many thousands of years ago capable of arranging and carving 50,000 pound blocks, then why is it so crazy to assume that uh, an ancient uh, New England civilization was capable of moving and carving something 20,000 pounds? Um, so it's really actually not that outlandish when you kind of consider uh, what exists globally and the size. And just really uh, briefly as well, this is a slide from my last presentation, um, just kind of giving you a, a, a big picture view of what we're looking at here. Um, I talk a lot about in this presentation stuff I find in an area called Megalith Metropolis, which is two 1.8 mile walls running down an old class 4 road. Um, totaling about 3.6 miles of walls total. Um, that amount of wall, assuming it's about three feet high, it's all made of granite, weighs just under three fully fueled uh, Saturn V rockets. It's an enormous amount of stone, 15.5 million pounds of stone. To put that into even bigger perspective, the low end estimate for stone walls in New England, most of them would be going through these forests. And in New Hampshire, uh, I think it's 90% of the state or 85% of the state is covered with forest. There's, in New England, there's at least, and there's, I would say there's definitely much more, there's at least a quarter million miles of walls, which is over a trillion pounds of stone, which is 10 times the weight of the Great Wall of China <laughs> in stone. Great Wall of China being 13,000 miles long. And it took the builders of the Great Wall Two, over 2,000 years to build something, which is 10 times smaller in weight than what we have in New England. So I think these stone walls that I'm looking at in New England go back many, many thousands of years, more, earlier than 2,000 years old, which again is not unreasonable to assume just using mainstream archaeological findings. Humans may have occupied North America 100,000 years earlier than thought. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe that's 150,000 years of human habitation in North America, which is absolutely mind blowing, and it, it just keeps getting older. Um, so let's. So that being said, here's a quick map of Megalith Metropolis. This is the Class Four road. The white lines are the walls bordering it. I, I map some walls I can see on Google Earth branching out. Um, I circle some important areas, some important common Native American stone features. So that's mainly what we're going to be focusing on is this area because it's so tightly packed with these structures. Um, so just let's start with some basic uh, w widely accepted Native American structures. This is in Inuksuk. Um, this is a very common uh, human effigy that you find in northern Canada and Greenland, built by natives there. Um, the practice of, the, of building these 
is thousands of years old. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's on a, a flag um, a, of a people up in that region. Um, as I was exploring the wall in Megalith uh, Metropolis, I actually found I, what I am quite certain is an Anuksuk built into a 1.8 mile long wall. Here you can see it sort of like, think of it as a snowman, these round stones going small to large down. Here, sitting on a tablet, which is sitting on two tablets, here would be its arms. And you can see it's very, very similar uh, to this uh, Anuksuk. And this is built again, so we have a very common uh, stone effigy of a human, something that you see widely accepted in native areas in Canada and Greenland. But this one is built into a mall, a wall that runs straight for 1.8 miles, which is on the other side of another 1.8 mile long wall, forming a path. And branching off this wall is untold more miles of stone walls. So this Anuksuk doesn't sit in isolation. This is part of a huge, huge network of walls, uh, weighing many, many, uh, uh, let's go back to my first slide. This network of walls, again, is going to weigh well over, is going to contain well over 15 and a half million pounds of stone. <laughs> and that all branches off from this, from this nice fellow right here, this really symmetrical structure. Now imagine, now the common theory, the common folklore of New Englanders is that something like this is built by farmers clearing their field. Or, or people making a boundary marker. If you're clearing your field, you're not finding tab. I guarantee you, you're not finding nice tablets of stone like this to begin with. And if you are, and you're making a boundary marker, um, you're not arranging them in a decorative symmetrical pattern like this, especially not in a 1.8 mile long wall. And look at this sphere of granite too. That's That's a, that's a nice feature. And there are, again, now there are also two spheres, two like grapefruit sized balls right here, adding more symmetry. This is a, a very precisely designed uh, structure in this massive, massive wall network that doesn't even scratch the surface of how big this total network is. And in the same wall, we have another, harder to see, but definitely in a nooksook. See right here, we have head, another round stone, we have this snowman structure right here. We have the what are known as lintels, these tablets as arms, and more symmetry with these boulders right here, and more tablets on the bottom. So you can see the symmetry right here. So two inuksuks um, in this megalith metropolis. And that's not all, folks. Uh, there is a very mainstream archaeological study called Manitou, written by Maver and Dix, um, surveying. Uh, uh, mostly in Vermont, but some new other, for other features in New England. Um, they note something called a Manitou stone, which is very common in this area study. You can see it here and here, head and shoulders representing a great spirit. Um, and then this other, and, uh, this other stone too, sort of looks like a bird arching over. This is in Mason, New Hampshire, on a wall network on the side of the road. And this Manitou stone is also in Mason. I found these two just driving around up there. This one's in Concord, Mass. Um, this is actually in Texas. This is sent to me by a group member. This one I found up here in New Hampshire. Um, so you can see the similarities. Uh, this one's sighted in Manitou in a stone row in Vermont. So here's our bird-like one matching here. Here's our Manitous right here and right here. And we have sort of uh, Manitou stones with the head off to the side. Here, 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 here. And what I realized the other day on Facebook is the sort of off to the side, non-symmetrical one. You can see that shape repeated here. This is in a um, polygonal masonry wall in South America. And South America contains some of the craziest megalithic structures in the wall in the world. Uh, the interesting thing about walls like this is they contain no mortar. And they contain blocks which are very peculiar shapes but are fit perfectly together. So finally you couldn't fit a razor blade. Uh, in between the cracks. So right in this slide we're connecting shapes we see in native sites all over Native America, uh, all over North America, to shapes we see in South America, and in findings in a mainstream archaeological study. So we're making some really good connections here, but let's go even further. Um, I found in another group a book uh, written by a famous collector of native artifacts uh, featuring these bird stones, small bird effigies, small representations of birds. And what I, you see here is in the megalithic metropolis, this large 
bird shaped stone which matches this guy right here minus the tail this would weigh in at about a thousand pounds and this has to be carved granite how are ancient people carving granite like this is a big question and why given how labor intensive that would be and again this is like the Anuksuk in that same over 15 million pound uh, wall network there's more to these bird effigies in Manitou two other bird effigies are cited Take a look at this one right here with this semicircle head. In this in this wall, this oops, let's get this focus back. This is a this is in a wall network a bit south, but you can see right here the curvature in the head, curvature in the back. This would be a bird effigy built right into a wall as well, and this is very very uh, precisely shaped. This looks like it was carved with a milling machine. Um, this is a very very interesting one. Um, Building on our curved head stone right here, let's go up to megalith level. Serious, serious megalith level. Note the semicircle head, semicircle head, and look how semicircular, I guess it's more of a quarter circle or quarter oval the body is. And this is a person standing right next to it. So this right here is a megalithic version of this bird effigy. And this is absolutely enormous. This this is this would be a, a true megalith, and this is in, in an area. I call the Turtle Fortress, which has the absolute largest stuff I've found. And this, this section is, is nuts. And here's another example of, a, of an effigy, more carved into a cliff, but you can see the head, the semicircle head poking out up here. Let's go further with these birds. Back to Manitou, we have this bird effigy with a longer head. One of these is Mississippian, one is Hopewellian. This is from a Facebook group specializing in uh, Vermont. You see the same thing. This is in someone's backyard. The uh, group members were saying this looked a lot like uh, the lake monster Nessie in Lake Champlain, but I think it's actually an F a uh, megalithic version of this bird effigy right here. You can see the clear, the clear similarity. All right, let's go to something uh, even more interesting: quartz. So quartz considered sacred by Incas in South America. Uh, quartz was used frequently in stone rooms around what's called the Upton Chamber. Keep the chambers in the back of your mind. You're going to see one in a bit. Manitou speaks about these megalithic stone chambers quite frequently. Um, the authors of Manitou were persuaded there is strong circumstantial evidence uh, regarding um, Indian uh, Native American origins and use of stone structures throughout New England. So not they weren't a hundred percent convinced, but they were convinced somewhat. But I think this work of mine is is adding to that, and we can get to a degree of certainty here, um, especially when we add in the folklore of Native American uh, tribal elders and historians like Doug Harris, an Algonquin tribal historian. He discusses. Um, Uctana, uh, a Cherokee serpent god that I believe the Algonquins also recognize as well. He discussed a star uh, in Uctana's neck. Um, he referenced an orange stone being used, but in this case, I think what we have here is the stone row representing its vertebrae and this large boulder of quartz representing the star in its neck, and this would be its head. I don't think colonists were purposely connecting these large boulders and stone rows with nice pieces of quartz. I also don't think colonists were building, again, these, these stone rows built out of the same lentil, domino, tablet type stones, arranging the same types of stones together. Arranging types of stones you wouldn't find occurring naturally, but you would have to carve. Adding to that, further up in this wall, right where it ends randomly in the forest, you see a perfectly pinned piece of quartz with a very flat face. Many of the megaliths in these walls have perfectly flat, not perfectly, very flat faces facing the viewer. I can't imagine how difficult it would be to build something like this up a steep hillside and to build it in such a way that you could use pressure to pin a piece of quartz like this precisely into place. Um, and there are more examples in the region of pinned pieces of quartz. So this boulder of quartz is pinned in a stone row nearby I can't imagine how far, I don't know how far down it goes, but it, you can't move this whatsoever. This is an example in Manitou. Oh no, this is a different archaeological book, I believe. But anyway, this is a very famous archaeologist, Jim Whittle. Um, he, this is in Ireland. He's holding two quartz diamonds found in the stone chamber. You'll see more on the chambers in a moment. Um, this is a limestone dimer, diamond from a historian. This was also found in Ireland. And in right here in New Hampshire, I found two 
very, we could call them, <laughs> I'd say, diamond-ish, very diamond, but anyway, two big diamond-ish pieces of quartz pinned in a split in a rock. And the, this area, we pulled some of the dirt out, and this area was packed with loose pieces of quartz. So there's some serious quartz going on here in North America and Europe, clearly. So there's another European, um, North American connection. There's a, my favorite piece of quartz I found so far this season. Nice red color in it. This is sitting in a wall in the megalith metropolis. And you see common Native American uh, features called piles or turtle effigies featuring quartz. If you go for a walk in the woods in the area where I explore, you're going to you're gonna trip over these. They're so common, you'll find quartz in maybe one out of ten. Here's one. Here's another. Here's another. So common Native American stone structures featuring quartz. Um, let's get a little more exotic. Um, going back to... Octana and this theory, uh, this spiritual belief in a, of a horned serpent. Um, this was a very uh, widespread Native American belief. Actually, this is actually a global, I believe, belief in this in this deity of a horned serpent. And as you explore alternative archaeology, you're going to find the further back you go, the more sort of uh, globally similar ideas there are um, theologically. So here we ha would have the serpent's head, and look, there is its horn and it's sitting on a split piece of bedrock. You see these, I call these hopping walls uh, because they, they, they quite literally hop. They stop or start at the end of a boulder and they'll continue down. But this is a combined serpent effigy hopping wall, it's a horned serpent. Here is a megalithic version of that. Um, rattlesnakes were native to uh, New England in history. And this one has its snout is is extremely similar and anatomically similar to that of a rattlesnake. The curvature of its head seems very uh, carved to me. Again, we have this hopping wall phenomenon where the wall uh, stops at the at this megalithic head. Another horned serpent. I believe this is another serpent effigy. Uh, this block would weigh in at about 3,500 to 4,000 pounds. Here, here is what would be its horn right here. Uh, this triangle, take note of this, this is back to uh, the megalith metropolis wall, the same wall I showed you that contained uh, numerous effigies inside of it. But taking a look at this triangle for now, uh, this weighs about 3,500 to 4,000 pounds as well, and in the same wall network about a mile and a half south, I found nearly the exact same triangle right there. Uh, both weighing in at about the same weight. So another coincidence that colonial farmers clearing fields or building boundary markers were moving um, boulders that weighed as much as cars that had the same shape and also finding nice cubes <laughs> nice cubes of granite I'd have never seen a cube of granite lying around so let's go back let's 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 build on the uh, North America to Europe uh, shared megalithic stone building tradition uh, these are two uh, pictures from Manitou uh, on the left, we see Hopewellian stone chambers, stone tombs out in the western United States. And this is an example of some European ones. Uh, the authors draw numerous comparisons between North American and um, European stone chambers. Uh, they do refer to the Upton stone chamber as containing megalithic blocks. So within those uh, exceptional walls in the megalith metropolis, there is a built-in chamber, which I found. Uh, the walls run north-south. This chamber faces east on one side and west on the other side. I, many people on my YouTube channel have claimed this is just a culvert. It does, I did poke my head in here, it, it does certainly look like it was built to, to, to stop. It doesn't go all the way through. It, 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 um, it tapers to a close about four and a half, five feet in. So there was definitely no, this was definitely not built to let water run through. Plus the fact that the slope runs this way, it's not running down this way. So that wouldn't make sense as a culvert. Um, I call it megalithic because this roof tablet, which looks carved when you view it from above, sort of notched on either side, this would weigh in at about 2,500 pounds. And there are about 35, four 3,500 pound blocks, tablets rather, going across the quote unquote path uh, to the other side this being the other side um, and it's something to note I just ordered a snake camera because it looks like there is a chamber behind this 
that is that is blocked off and I want to see what's in there. Someone from uh, Europe suggested this might actually be a megalithic tomb. So if that's the case, that's going to be really interesting. Um, now we're going to go to something called the hopping walls. Um, and we'll touch on something else um, in relation to those. But sticking with the walls in megalith metropolis, here's another one of those hopping walls. Um, why would a colonial farmer build, build a, a useless stone road to one of these boulders? and then start it up here on the other side. Um, these, but what I would want to draw your attention to is, is the base bedrock here. It tapers in, there's a slight curvature right here, and there's this triangle boulder sticking in the, uh, in, in the indent. And on another hopping wall several miles away, this is actually one of the first things I found doing this, you see a very similar curved boulder indent. This one actually has a triangle cutout right here, and in that triangle cutout, there is a triangle stone uh, pointing into the into the triangular cutout in granite, which would be quite difficult to carve. Um, again, similar, we have that same triangle in that hopping wall. On top of this hopping wall, a bit further away, and this will bring us back to Megalith Metropolis, um, the side profile of this wall up here, you see a pattern. You see these notch tablets right here. So here's this right angle notch and above it is this right angle notch. This one's filled in with this triangle. You see a tablet here. So you actually see very uh, 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 delicately chosen and placed stones and patterns here. Uh, the pattern gets even more intense. Again, remember we have this notch tablet, notch tablet. These flip 180 degrees further back on the wall with this Big boy right here probably weighs a thousand or fifteen hundred pounds, and this one right here with a really precise notch. This one's a little less precise, but both are filled in with rocks, small rocks. These notches are a pattern you see, and I can expand these up to megaliths in the walls of Megalith Metropolis. This I would consider a megalith. It would weigh in at about sixteen thousand pounds. I think I overestimated it in the last video. I call it said eighteen thousand. I'm moving it down to sixteen thousand pounds. And it has this distinct notch right here, filled in with this very big tablet of stone. I've seen multiple examples, some much bigger than this, one weighing about 30,000 pounds with notches on the bottom right. And it seems always in these megaliths and walls, they have notches on the bottom right. Very distinct patterns here. Um, so I transitioned from these hopping walls into the notches, but I'm going to go back to the hopping wall again. Remember, I referenced this, what I call megalithic serpent effigy. Um, hopping wall. So behind the head you see a big piece of at first glance bedrock and here's what it looks like up close. It's about 12 feet tall. Just take a look at the texture. It looks almost fluffy. It's carved in. It has these interesting splits and it has uh, these huge boulders filled in this crevasse in the bottom. Let's compare it to the other hopping wall base boulders. So I think you can see what I mean. They have very similar sort of rounded, fluffy, quote unquote, texture. They curve in, they are filled in. These two, remember they have the triangles. Uh, here's the triangle on this one. Um, but again, here, these, these, these are all um, huge, rounded. I'm not trying to be dramatic. They just, the, the kind of shape, vibe the shape gives me is sort of a UFO shape. Um, not trying to say this is UFO, it's just it's just the, 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 the idea the shape is giving me. And they're all topped with these hopping walls. Just this one is way, way bigger. Okay, so we've got small, medium, large. And with that, I'm going to close it out. I think that presentation does tie together uh, a number of important concepts that I'm seeing out in these woods and uh, kind of bring it together the idea that uh, there's, there's a sort of uh, remnant of uh, Atlantis sitting in the woods of New England. Thank you.